As its title suggests, Akira Kurosawa's 1963 crime drama High and Low is divided into two halves. The first is a suspenseful small-scale drama set entirely at the Gondo residence. The second is an intensely detail-oriented procedural in which police officers work to track down the kidnapper from the first half. We start high and end low. There exists a number of differences between these two contrasting sections of the film, in both storytelling and visual direction. The high drama of the Gondo residence is interpersonal, intimate, restricted to one location, whereas the low drama of the police investigation involves a multitude of characters and is scattered across a plethora of varied locations, expanding the scope of the film to include the larger context of the world or environment these characters inhabit. Of course, this division carries with it a number of implications, one being that it illustrates a socio-economic divide. The rich and powerful are secluded from the rest of society, those down below, whereas the poor intermingle and are collectively determined by their chaotic environment. Both of these segments illustrate what are, in my view, the two most important facets of Kurosawa's direction. Kurosawa sees characters as elements of a larger whole and defines them using techniques that establish striking dynamics and relations, whether that's a dynamic between two characters or between a character and their environment, their world. The first half of the film showcases some of Kurosawa's most intricate and sustained blocking, with characters constantly maintained within a strict set of relations that illustrate the shifting power dynamics of this suspenseful situation. Seeing as these sequences generally concern the decision Gondo must make and the various factors he takes into account, Kurosawa's blocking here is meant to establish what forces are driving Gondo and which concerns he is taking into consideration. There's a particularly significant scene in which Gondo and his wife argue about what they should do, but rather than shooting this scene as a simple shot-reverse shot, Kurosawa places the police officers in the foreground and relegates the main dramatic object of this scene to the background. This serves to highlight another, less obvious dimension of this interaction, how other people perceive it, how other people will interpret Gondo's decision. This blocking strategy runs throughout the entire film, Dialogue and character dynamics are constantly placed within a larger context of social relations, and this technique can also be found in a number of other Kurosawa films as well. While the ongoing dialogue is important, it's how that dialogue is undermined, or how our interpretation of it is altered by the social and interpersonal context which is most valued in Kurosawa's blocking. In this film in particular, this visual strategy emphasizes the dilemma our protagonist is faced with. The other characters and their presence on screen, despite them not being immediately relevant to the main action of the scene, come to represent a weight on Gondo's shoulders, outside perspectives that could sway his decision-making process. He is not a free moral agent in this situation. He is being influenced by other characters' perception of him. But whereas those relations between characters is the visual focus of the first half, High and Low's second half is much more interested in the relations of different locations, as we find ourselves immersed in the excruciatingly detailed procedure of the investigation and follow every single possible lead, travelling to a variety of locations around town. But not before the Gondo house itself is reframed. We finally see the house from the outside, from down below looking up, Characters even comment on how it feels like the house is looking down on them. This shift in perspective will reflect the general shift that occurs in this second half. We now see not only the police's point of view, but the kidnapper's point of view as well. The whole world is opened up to us, revealing an entirely different set of relations. The specific minutia of how all of these elements interact paint the picture of a full and nuanced world, very much encapsulated in the chaos of the nightclub sequence, where all of these complex relations become entangled. This very much stands in contrast to the slick, minimalistic, and theatrical composition of the first section. 
This divided and contrasting view of economic disparities is seemingly leveled in the film's final scene. Gondo and the kidnapper finally meet face to face, no longer separated by their initial spatial divide, now only separated by a thin plane of glass. And while nothing is really accomplished in this scene, there is no justice, no setting things right, there is, at last, recognition. The two perspectives meet, gazing into one another, and we as an audience recognise, thanks to Kurosawa's blocking, how these two opposite existences are entangled. They exist in tandem, and the actions of one will inevitably affect the other. Of course, socioeconomic divides are a common theme found all throughout Kurosawa's filmography, and The Hidden Fortress is another film that provides a particularly strong illustration of Kurosawa's interest in this theme, but portrays this kind of divide in a very different manner to high and low. The opening sequence immediately sets up how this film will tackle the matter of differing class perspectives. Of course, in contrast with High and Low, The Hidden Fortress will adopt a more comedic tone. The film begins with our two protagonists, Matashichi and Tahe, shot from behind as they traverse a desert battlefield. The camera's positioning immediately places the viewer on their level, immersing us in the desolate environment and the tale of these two impoverished characters. We feel as though we are being dragged along with them. The handheld camera's gentle bobbing up and down emphasises the feeling of a long, tired journey. The landscape ahead also seems to indicate that these characters don't really know where they're going. They're wandering around aimlessly and there's nothing in sight. No future, no prospects. The two characters bickering is interrupted by a wounded samurai who stumbles into frame, chased by soldiers on horseback. The way these characters emerge out of nowhere as if Matashichi and Tahe hadn't heard them arrive instills a kind of absurd theatrical tone, like characters materialising as they appear on stage. Naturally, we are not shown where they come from nor where they leave to. This maintains our focus on the two protagonists, limiting our perspective in order to match theirs. This event is happening to them. It's a development in their story. The larger context doesn't really matter because it's a context they don't have access to. This illustrates the experience of the powerless, the small, unimportant people living in a war-torn nation who, unlike the valiant heroes and tragic kings who usually populate these stories, have a severely limited picture of what's actually going on. The political developments, the latest battles and victories, in their eyes it's all chaos, a chaos they must navigate in order to survive. They are blown about in the winds of war, caught in developments that surpass them. Needless to say, The Hidden Fortress also thematizes the environment and our character's interaction with it throughout the film. The environment can be used as a weapon, or a shield, it can be an obstacle in a character's journey, It can yield treasures. And it can even come alive. The portrayal of the living conditions of the poor is taken to the extreme in Dodescaden and the Lower Depths. Again, the high and low of class divisions is illustrated here. The Lower Depths literally opens with a low angle shot of two people atop a hill dumping trash down into what they assume is a heap of rubbish, but which a downward pan reveals to be a house of some kind. The Lower Depths is another of Kurosawa's adaptations taken from Russian literature, this time a play by Maxim Gorky. Kurosawa had previously adapted Dostoevsky's The Idiot in 1951, his Ikiru from the following year was partly based on Tolstoy's death of Ivan Ilyich, a subplot in his 1965 film Red Beard was inspired by another Dostoevsky novel, Humiliated and Insulted, and of course Dezu Ozala from 1975 was based on Vladimir Arsenyev's memoir of the same name. 
Russian literature seems to inform much of Kurosawa's outlook and the philosophical undercurrents of his films, specifically in the way he approaches societal ills, political turmoil, and the individual subject's relation to socio-economic structures. Kurosawa even stated that Dostoevsky was the author who wrote most honestly about human existence. In the case of The Lower Depths, Kurosawa leans into the film's inherent theatrical qualities, its limited sets and minimal movement, in order to exacerbate the claustrophobic anxiety of this crammed setting, and accentuate the feeling of immobility and stagnation in these characters' lives. Roku-chan's fantasy tram in Dodescaden is perhaps also a consequence of this kind of socio-economic inertia. He imagines himself as a tram conductor, travelling around all day and seeing sights. It's an escape from the constant limitations and emptiness of his tragic reality, one in which there is no progression, no free exploration of the outside world, no variety. And while we don't see the tram Rokuchan imagines, we do see the house the homeless man imagines building piece by piece. And similarly, in the lower depths, there's a scene where the old man reassures the sick woman, telling her it won't be like this in the next world. In these films, the imaginary is often deployed to escape reality. But the imaginary isn't always so reassuring in Kurosawa's films. It can be the cause of, as well as the escape from, inner turmoil. One of Kurosawa's most underappreciated films is his 1955 drama I Live in Fear, which tells the story of an elderly foundry owner who becomes obsessed with the idea that Japan is on the brink of nuclear war. He intends on taking his family to South America, where they will supposedly be safe from this imminent destruction. The film ends with the old man burning down his own foundry and being sent to a psychiatric facility where he convinces himself that he has escaped to another planet and that the sun he sees through the window is actually Earth after the nuclear apocalypse. So in this film, the protagonist's imaginary literally drives him insane and the only escape from this horrific image that haunts him at all times, this imagined future apocalypse, is to delve even deeper into fantasy and illusion. A nation's collective consciousness, their fears and anxieties, can also be an environmental structure that defines a character. Of course, the looming shadow of nuclear holocaust is also seen in Rhapsody in August, a film all about a woman who lost her husband in the bombing of Hiroshima. This film also ends with its elderly main character lost in a delusion. Haunted by the past, she battles a storm, marching toward Hiroshima in hopes of warning her husband of the impending threat. Here, the storm represents the winds of time, the insurmountable chasm between the present and the past. And this is only one of the many uses Kurosawa makes of weather across his filmography. In I Live in Fear, characters are constantly dabbing their foreheads and fanning their faces. The heat is a not-so-subtle indicator of the growing unease and anxiety concerning the threat of nuclear war. In The Hidden Fortress, Kurosawa literalizes the fog of war, again emphasizing the main character's limited understanding of what's going on around them. Of course, impossible to forget Kurosawa's signature use of rain as representative of the dire moral reality his characters must inhabit, as seen in Rashomon. Naturally, this recurring motif of weather is often connected to Kurosawa's environmental concerns. The snowstorm sequence in Dazu Ozala, for example, is a frightening reminder of man's contentious relationship with nature. Kurosawa believes that man must fear nature, or at the very least respect its power. But nowhere are Kurosawa's concerns about the environment more vividly expressed than in his own dreams. Here, once again, man's connection to nature is fraught with uncertainty and danger. The first story of this anthology sees a child being warned by his mother not to go outside while it's raining, because that's when the foxes have their wedding ceremonies. Of course, the child disobeys his mother and must face the consequences. 
The second story also features a warning not to go outside. This time the boy is lured outside by a spirit from a recently chopped down peach orchard. Navigating the natural world with care and purpose requires its own set of long-standing traditions, lest we find ourselves overstepping into a world not meant for us, leading to the disruption of this other order. Virtually all of these visual and thematic concerns are expressed in Kurosawa's 1952 masterpiece, Ikiru. The film focuses on the struggles of Kanji Watanabe, an aging bureaucrat who leads a boring, monotonous life before one day learning he has stomach cancer and deciding to turn his life around before it's too late. After hearing about the concerns of a group of parents who want a local cesspool cleaned up and replaced with a playground, Watanabe decides to take matters into his own hands. At first, the parents are endlessly referred away to different departments, each pointing back to one another in a kind of Kafkaesque nightmare, until Watanabe steps up and makes sure the project comes to fruition. The premise itself obviously highlights environmental concerns, but unlike in Dazu Ozala or Dreams, which deal more directly with man's relation to nature unmediated, here those concerns are entangled within social and political structures, such that the film becomes an exploration of how certain political configurations and systemic flaws passively restrict the possibility of change in the world, and the film paints a picture of the kind of outlook on life that would be necessary in order to enact positive change in the world in spite of these flawed systems. At first, the film presents itself as a rather straightforward character study. We're shown Watanabe in his usual work environment, framed by piles of documents and a rigid office layout. His character and state of mind are portrayed clearly. However, after his big revelation, his behavior is transformed, a transformation that is conveyed during his night out with the writer. Their journey through a variety of new locations indicate Watanabe's newfound openness to the world and its diverse experiences. While Kurosawa generally prioritizes wide shots that enframe a character within their social context, Ikiru features a number of memorable close-ups too. They are often deployed to highlight emotionally significant moments in Watanabe's life, important memories, moments of realization or lamentation. But perhaps more interestingly, they are also used to portray a clash between an individual and a system, between individuality and conformity. In a film full of crowded shots, these close-ups tell the story of a man alone in his struggle, a man determined to rise above this bureaucratic network and effect change in this system, motivated solely by his individual willpower. And so here, a close-up emphasizes the character's individuation from their social context. However, two-thirds of the way through the film, Watanabe dies, and we witness the gathering of all the other characters at his wake. The composition and blocking of this scene are reminiscent of a number of other films in which Kurosawa portrays formal arrangements, such as a meeting between a feudal lord and his retainers, or the dynamic between a teacher and his students. We could perhaps describe this compositional style as isometric, in how it projects elements onto the filmic space, as opposed to organizing the elements of the image into depth, as you would with a more classical perspective. This visual strategy serves to activate the viewer's gaze, forcing our eyes to zigzag across the surface of the image. We partake in the composition of these dynamics. In these scenes, characters are distributed across the image in layers. They become atoms whose positions can be rearranged with respect to one another according to the principles of social hierarchical relations. Thus, this isometric projection highlights particular social and political configurations. After Watanabe's death, his world, his bureaucratic environment, in short, the system he was a part of, attempts to diminish his individual achievements. We watch as the other officials self-servingly aggrandize themselves and their role in the development of this project. The argument is made that, after all, this project could not have come to fruition without the participation of other departments, and in fact, it was never Watanabe's responsibility to begin with. But all of this is interrupted by the arrival of the townsfolk, who have actually been affected by Watanabe's actions. We cut rapidly back and forth between the faces of the shamed officials, who previously espoused their own importance and value, and the faces of the weeping women, who are a living testament to Watanabe's importance, his legacy. While others may attempt to diminish his achievements or disperse responsibility across the different branches of the system that would not have taken action without Watanabe, in the end, Watanabe made the conscious decision to contribute to this change in the world, and he will be remembered for it. 
this world will remember his deeds. After the departure of the higher-ups, the sequence then transforms into a kind of polemic narrative, which is in some ways reminiscent of the debate surrounding truth in Rashomon. The remaining colleagues sit around, eating, drinking, and continue their examination of Watanabe's strange behaviour and possible motivations. At first, the scene maintains the same visual structure as before, with all the colleagues neatly arranged in rows facing one another. But once the characters begin to openly discuss and understand the broken nature of their system, and realise what it took for Watanabe to finally take action, Kurosawa removes them from their formal placement. They disperse themselves, taking new positions in the scene, disrupting the conformity, conveying a shift in their modes of thought. However, the next day at work, nothing has changed. One man stands up, realising what's happening, but he soon sits back down. Kurosawa's camera hiding his face behind the ever-growing pile of paperwork, the bureaucracy that eats up his individuality and willpower. The drunken revolt from the night before was simply talk, a fleeting moment of hope that is quickly crushed by the weight of this system. In the last flashback shown in the film, our last glimpse of Watanabe's final moments, he is seen on a swing in the park he helped build. He sings a song. Here, for the last time, we see Watanabe framed within a structure. He is enframed or enshrined in his own creation, his legacy. At the end of a life almost wasted, Watanabe returns to childhood. The end circles back to the beginning, revealing the true purpose of his actions. It was not to be remembered, it was not to be praised, it was not self-satisfaction. As all political action must be, it is aimed at the future, such that we may offer our children a childhood better than our own. Kurosawa's films are always turned towards the future in this way. He is a filmmaker interested in the responsibility we bear to one another. Ikiru is a film that demonstrates that a relationship with our environment is a relationship with our fellow man, and with our past and future. His is a world of community, of shared responsibility, in which cinematic techniques are deployed to remind us of and reinforce those ties, such that we may never forget where we stand in this world.